Welcome to Confidence Bites. Start your week the confident way with short, juicy confidence takeaways brought to you by Stuart Elliott from Double C Coaching. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of Confident Bites. And today, I am really honored to have Charlotte Canyon, who is the author of You Have to Laugh to Keep from Crying, How to Parent Your Parents as a special guest on this show. And she's an author and obviously she's had a lot of life experiences. And, you know, I've had a brief talk with her before and she's a wonderful person. And, you know, when we go back to her book, it says, you know, she, it's about how to find the permissions to laugh, to cry and to make mistakes. And you'll also find the strength and encouragement to get up and repeat the cycle, all the tools you need to face the new challenge of parenting your parents. And Charlotte has has bought and sold several businesses over the years, from a shop in a strip mall to managing 25 women in the spokes modeling industry. Charlotte recently retired from a large corporation where she worked in the event planning department and never to be one just to sit around. She's now the CEO of a startup business intent on selling a product she invented. Charlotte is a creative writer who has penned and published several stories and poems. So, Charlotte, welcome. Thank you very, very, very much for coming here today. It's a great pleasure to have you. Thank you, Stuart. It's a pleasure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I would like to know is why a book about parenting your parents? Well, you know, I think it's mostly therapy for me at first, but my friends kept hearing my stories and they go, Charlotte, you need to put this down in a book because other people want to hear these stories because they can relate to them. And some of the things I learned through through my journey, my journey was through my father-in-law with dementia, my mother with Alzheimer, and my dad with Parkinson. Mm -hmm. So I kind of went like baptism by fire. I became an expert in this field of things to keep your parents connected to you, even though their minds are wandering off somewhere else. Yeah, we're talking about, um, obviously, when parents get a little bit older and they start losing their faculties and how much of a challenge and a stress it can be on you, on you as a person. Yeah, and I can relate to this because my father, you know, he's unfortunately getting on a little bit and he's starting to suffer from dementia. And, you know, it is a big challenge. It is a big challenge. And you've got first-hand experience, haven't you? Yeah, well, it's sad to see the person that was your rock, the person you went to to ask questions that now needs you to take control. Yeah, and they don't really know that. It's 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 just a really quandary to figure out which way, you know, you don't want, I never dreamed and I never wanted to parent my parents. No, I mean, it's yeah. not something you would expect, is it? No, it's, it's just a role that I think what's happening is because of medicine. Say 50 years ago, they didn't worry about parenting their parents because people died so much younger. Mm. But now with medicine, everyone's living longer. Yeah. So... The physical body is still there. The mind's kind of going, and, of course, the body gets real frail as, as well. Yeah, and, and for me, what, what I see is I see the same face, I hear the same voice, but it's empty. There's nothing behind it. Yeah. And, and it can be a shock, you know. Sometimes you're expecting, because of, you know, your history with your parents, you're expecting the same dynamic person and the same sort of... Uh, rapport and, and, and um, you know answers to questions or conversation and it's nothing comes out but the voice yeah. is the same and the face is the same and it's it, it is a heck of a shock to the system yeah i want to i want to get on the phone you know and call my mom and mm -hmm. you know she, you know she's not there even when she was physically there yeah you know, she's not there not. Mm. so so you know um if you'd like to just give us a little bit more about your family, your background, etc., and, you know, what made you start writing, I think that would be a great introduction. Okay. I guess I've kind of always been a writer, but about 10 years ago, I started journaling, you know, things that were happening with the family, just mainly just because I didn't want to lose some of the funny stories. Mm -hmm. There's one of them that's really, really kind of funny. There's a joke my mother loved, mm -hmm. and she would call me up and say, Charlotte, what's the punchline to afraid not joke? Well, afraid not is the punchline to the joke. Yep. But in her, she couldn't, you know, get it all straight. Mm -hmm. So I wrote all that down and, you know, just different things. Um, when she was 89 years old, um, I I'm, I'm also 
sing a little bit. So I sang for my father and I had written a poem for my mother. And um, it was about the hands of love that, you know, she was the hands that combed my hair and, and dressed me and everything as a child. And now I'm, I, I'm the, was the one that was holding her hands and they were so frail and, you know, so thin and, and weak and, uh, and it got published. That poem okay. got published. It sounds like a very inspiring poem. Thank you. Well, it's in my book, so. Okay. Okay. You'll get to, you'll get to see it. Mm -hmm. So what made you decide to share your experiences with the public and, you know, write the book and obviously now, you know, what was the uh, impetus for I that? Think, I think the trigger point, like I said, I've been journaling off and on through 10 years through this whole process. My mother passed away last year. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, I, you know, God spoke to me and he said, okay, now it's the time. And I'd, I, for the last three or four years, I had been wanting to go to a writer's seminar and I ended up going to a writer's seminar in April. And, um, and basically, I had probably written half my book. So in April and now, I've finished my book. Mm -hmm. And, I've, you know, I kind of divided my book into love. And there's stories of, of love in there. there. There's stories of respect. There's stories of patience. And not, not just patience with them. Patience with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And their forgiveness. And that means, you know, they're going to, example, my mom yelled and screamed and told me never to come back. And she, did, you know, it, and I had to forgive her, even though I knew that wasn't her. You know, it hurt. It hurt. Cause of course it hurts. Yeah. Her voice was there. The person was there and the words were coming out. But I had to forgive her as we were going through it. And, of course, I had to go home and cry all day after it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is a very difficult task to, to realize that, you know, the, the tantrums or whatever that, that are presented to you aren't the real person. You know, they're right. a symptom of what they're going through, really. And it's very difficult because you take it as a, a, as a, a you know, a frontal assault on yourself. And you're doing your best and you're, you're struggling because, you know, really, it's not something that we, we ever think about reversing the role models, is it? No, it's not. I, in my wildest dreams, I guess I, I think we all just think that, you know, life's going to go on and the parents are going to die in their, die in their bed and, you know, mm -hmm. and then we go on. Yeah. But it's not happening that way. No. There are more nursing homes in the world now than there's ever been. And, you know, that's also a challenge in itself because not all the nursing homes are given the best care, are they? Exactly. I looked at 25 homes actually before my parents were going to be. I didn't realize I'd have both of them, mm -hmm. you know, down. But, uh, but I knew that my mom would, I just kind of, you know, you kind of feel like the mother's going to live longer than the dad. It yeah. just kind of happens that way mostly so i've been looking at homes for three years for my mother because i knew her alzheimer's was getting worse and worse and worse and she had a lot of other complications and what i would have brought my mother into my home except my father-in-law had already lived with us for 10 years mm -hmm. and i had experienced a lot of the dementia and a lot of it and i i, I told my husband I just I, you know I, I, do, I just can't go through that again. I, and, and I discovered, and one of the things that I, I bring out in my book is, and, it, and it's up to the individual. They have to do what their hearts desires. But I have friends who brought their mothers in, but by the time that journey was over, they hated their mother and their mother hated them. Mm -hmm. And I did not want that with my mother. No. So with me, with my mom, and she had COPD, she had a broken hip. With her being in the nursing home, they could change her diapers and I could have all the good and I could love her and comb her hair mm -hmm. and dress her and, and, you know, coddle her. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we, we, like I said, except for those few times when she would tell me, you know, but, but really I'm lucky. There was really only two times that she, you know, got angry at me. Yep. And I think, I think it was just cause she was in some kind of pain you know, I can look back at it and, yeah. and see that. But I got the best of the, of the world. And, you know, the way society set up, uh, it was it was perfect. I could go visit her every day. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I could feed her. And that was the weird thing. 
is, you know, she's the one that taught me to use a spoon. Yeah. And now I'm feeding her. In fact, I've even got granddaughters that love to go up there with me and they would feed their Nana. Yeah. And, and you know, there's, um, I suppose there's a, a feeling of helplessness that comes about the whole situation that affects the family. And what particularly strikes me is if you have a child yourself and you teach it and you're changing the nappies or the diapers or whatever you want to call them and helping it go to the toilet, it's sort of acceptable because it's a young child. But when you have to reverse the role and do it with a, an adult, you know, and that adult is, is, you know, is someone who should be in your, you know, past thinking, the leader, then it becomes a very, very, very different situation. And, and I, I suppose that a lot of people could try to run away from that um, uh, reality because it's too much for them to handle, too much for them to face. Yeah, I hate to say that. Now, I ended up putting, my mother ended up in a nursing home very close to me. And it was a smaller nursing home. There was only like 100 residents. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing was, they said I visited more than anybody else had visitors. Mm -hmm. And they said my mama, who we called Nana, she had more visitors because mm -hmm. she had 18 grandkids, great grandkids. Mm -hmm. excuse me. She had five grandkids and 18 great grandkids. And, you know, as they would come in town and all that, we'd go visit. When she'd have a birthday party, you know, half of them would show up. And, mm -hmm. and you know, we were there, but, but it was sad to see the other residents there. In fact, I still go to not that nursing home, but I go to another nursing home still just because people need, need, need people that come in and say, I love you. Yeah. And, and I think sometimes the children, they don't intentionally abandon, but they, 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 they because of the situation, they, they don't know how to handle it. They don't get the support and the advice that they need. And I think that's where, you know, your stories, your book would be very useful to many, many people because they, they'll yeah, start I, to understand what's going on. I'm, I, I know I'm a strong woman, but I feel like I'm really tough because I, I was there. I went through it and I, I even had a, have a son that didn't, he didn't come, he was 15 minutes away. Mm -hmm. I think or twice a year yeah. because he's, I want to remember her the way she was. Yeah. Not the and I think is. that may be the mentality that some of them, you know, some of them have. Well, it, it is in some ways now. understandable. Yeah, but she's still my mom. Yeah, she's still and your she's mom and she still needs your support, your love, your respect. It's just, you know, she's she's got an illness really, isn't it? Right. Well, and then when my dad got in there, now my dad was a Marine. Mm -hmm. So he was a very hard man. He... um his mother died when he was two years old. So I guess I give him a few excuses. Mm -hmm. um, he um, not only was a Marine, he joined the Marines when he was 14 and was in a foxhole in Guadalcanal at 15. Okay, so that's pretty so hard. The man, yeah, so the man had a rough life and he didn't know how to show his love. He was very proud of me. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure as a child, but I don't remember ever telling me he loved me. So when he went down, it was a whole different story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know, that this, this being able to show love is a, is a very, very important uh, facet because even it, children to the parents, they sometimes don't know how to show love to the parents. And there, there could be many reasons for that. So if we have a, a child who's got that certain uh, thinking and then their parents get very sick and, and, you know, dementia or Alzheimer's or something like that. They don't know how to reciprocate what they've been given or they are reciprocating what they, they feel they've been given. So they think they're doing well, but they're actually, there's a barrier that they haven't crossed. And that can be very, very difficult, as I say. Yeah, my dad was 86 when he passed, but he, he ended up, <laughs> this is, Ironical. My father-in-law died in 2007 in December. Mm -hmm. My mother went down in February of 2008, and my father followed within four months. And when I say went down, they had to have full-time help. They went yeah. in the hospital. And part of that is some of the stories that I tell. But the last 18 months of my father's life, um, he told me he loved me more than he had my whole life. Mm -hmm. Because I... I, I I mean, I, he was he was in the same nursing home with my mom. Although I had him in opposite ends, 
they were one of those, they were married 62 years, but they loved, but they weren't in love, if that makes sense. So mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I, he was just a hard man to live with. And, mm-hmm. uh, but God gave me the gift of him, him finally showing me he loved me because I was, you know, I and, was taking. And that is a big reward in itself, isn't it? It's a shame it had to come oh. that way, but it's a big reward. It helps you get through. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Because, it, you know, I think, it, you know, in that situation, if, um, you know, if you're suddenly faced with this reality of your parents and, you know, it's natural to get depressed, obviously, it's natural to, to suffer. And, but if you've got then, like your father, the relationship suddenly blossomed in, in a way, then it can help you get through any depression or something that, that uh, is associated with the, the circumstances. Oh, definitely. Definitely. It was, it was a gift. Mm-hmm. It was definitely a gift because I loved him. I just didn't like him. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. When you read my book, that's probably one of the heaviest stories. It's called The Forgiveness Story that's in my book. And um, there is a lot of more history in there. I won't go into it on, on this video. But, yeah. So um, what other tips would you give to people who are in the same situation and they're battling the depressive you know the depression that's associated with the depression part of it uh yeah and it and it goes from both sides mm-hmm. i even i went to the doctor one time for i had <laughs> and you know what when you get down when you have a lot of things it seems like everything attacks you i had laryngitis sinusitis and bronchitis mm-hmm. all i go once. to the doctor mm-hmm. all at once yet every time he looked at me crooked i was crying and he said what's going on and i said well pop mom and dad you know within yeah. a three-month period i was bombarded with all of this and i my brother lives in alaska he was no help at all no he, he you know he be honest with you he just and he told me this he said they've already they're gone to me yeah. they're dead hmm. you know he he was one of those uh and he couldn't move down here but you know uh he said i'll give you money but that didn't help a whole lot. No, you know? and, and he, you know he's diso- physically dissociated from them. So I mean, he's probably already made a certain mental switch in subconsciously, and you know, it doesn't yeah. want to spoil the memories. And it's, it, sometimes it's difficult to uproot your life anyway. You know, that's, right? That's that's, yeah. that's a challenge. Yeah. I mean, I have a but similar my- situation with my. Um, father because he's in the UK. I mean, and I'm living in China, and I've been here 13 years. And, you know, my sister's there, my brother's in, in Germany, he can get over more easily than me. But it is it is a big challenge and it's, you know, it's something somehow we have to face. Um, right. You know, fortunately well, with modern probably, community... Sorry? I was just going to say, you probably at least go visit once a year, right? Yeah, at least. Else. But, you know, the other the other thing I was going to add is that with modern communications, it's, it's a little bit better. But, you know, the, the problem being that, you know, if I make an arrangement to call him, he forgets. <laughs> oh, he forgets you're going to call. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we, we have to be a little bit careful with the scheduling and things like that. So, it, you know, it, no, see, it, is, it is interesting in, in some ways. Yeah. Well, see, when my parents, we did, you know, of course, they live close enough to me. I could see them personally. Mm-hmm. But my brother can't. No. And my parents, you know, and I'll be honest with you. You know, since my mother has died and he used to come down once a year um, and my mother was the last one to die, um, he hasn't come down. You know, no. I'll, I'll I'll call him every once in a while to check on him. But, uh, well, he lives in Alaska. You know, he's kind of a hermit. Mm-hmm. You know, when, you know, he loves to go out and fly fish by himself. And, yeah. you know, I, I figure he's going to be attacked by a big bear and, you know, <laughs> he he probably, he probably make friends with the bear, you know. People who live in the wilds tend to have a very different philosophy than we do. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in the wilds of Africa, so I can understand the the joy of, of isolation and, and and the. I mean, I've, I've camped there and I've had lions walking around the tent, sniffing the tent at night time, and that was no problem. You know, I've been charged by buffaloes, no problem. It's exciting, it's fun, it's part of life, but. For other Ooh. people, it's not. I mean, I can remember there was a, a, a woman on, on this trip we went on, and she spent the whole night in the tent with a hammer in her hand, 
And she was probably about 65, 70 because there were hyenas walking around and she was so petrified she didn't get a, a wink of sleep. So, you know, you can understand someone who's not used to that having a big issue but you know if you get used to it it's not it's not really a big issue you obviously you're careful and that uh, but you you know it's no in reality it's no more dangerous than a baby crossing a road because the baby doesn't have an awareness okay so i don't ask me how or why that happened um we were talking about the wilds of africa uh, and the attitude you know the attitude that people have can affect the <clears throat> the circumstances that they live in and the um you know obviously the attitude the circumstances that you, you know you're faced with with an aging parent or, or whatever the attitude you have there is very crucial in in the way you handle the challenges isn't it oh definitely you have to have a positive attitude when you go in or and, and so do all the caregivers the nurses the nurses aides if they don't have a positive attitude i've actually seen nurses be fired at the nursing home where my mother was mm -hmm. because they weren't upbeat. Because if you're not upbeat, you know, it doesn't take anything for a resident, you know, to go down, mm -hmm. you know, to be, to, they're, they're, they're in a state of flux. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen my mother, uh, she, you know, she would be laughing mm -hmm. so hard one minute and the next minute, I have no idea what triggered it, but she would be crying with tears rolling down her yeah. cheeks. And, 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 and I hug her, you know, I give her a hug. And that's the reason I loved the nursing home my mom was at. Because mm -hmm. if I wasn't there, all the nurses, they would walk by her and they would hug her whenever they would see her. Or mm -hmm. if she was wanting to tell them a story, they would, they would listen to her story, even though they, they may have heard it 17 dozen times you know well this um, this is the problem isn't it you know that one of the problems because you know when i speak to my father i'll tell him something he'll repeat and, say, and ask the same question about seven times because it's the the, the, the long-term memory doesn't seem to be so badly affected the short-term memory is the biggest issue isn't it, it the short-term memory is what goes first especially with dementia and alzheimer's yeah. it's the end one of the tests that i learned with my mother and realized that she was going into a dementia was if you repeat five words, mm -hmm. say free, green, wall, door, uh, car, you know, like that. And then you say, okay, mom, tell me those words back. Mm -hmm. She might can think of two of them. Mm -hmm. You know, in her younger day, it would have been no problem to repeat those. Yeah. And, and it progressively got, you know, worse and worse and worse. And, you know, we were talking about things to keep her connected. My mom was an accountant. Mm -hmm. so from a very young age, at 19, she started out, you know, in the business world. So something triggered in my head. I said, why don't I get flashcards like they use with first and second graders back in the day? Mm -hmm. And I did. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, hold up a flashcard that would say green, or I'd hold up one that was two plus two. And the green one might trigger a story about a green car she used to own. Mm -hmm. And it's cool, because it, I got to hear stories, mm -hmm. you know. I realized, I watched her. In her story, she would tell me, I watched her go back to her teenage years because mm -hmm. the stories she were telling me, I could tell that they came from, you know, back when she was in high school. So, so in a roundabout way, it, it, there's a benefit that you, you know, you find out more about your parents than you would ever have found out before, isn't there? They're almost definitely most definitely is you know let them talk trigger find something that triggers you know triggers their their mind their memory i even made a uh i call it an adult vision board you know you've seen these children's yeah. boards that have society things well my mom was also a seamstress she mm -hmm. taught me to sew and she made all my clothes i was very mm -hmm. petite she made all my clothes and when i got old enough she taught me to sew and i was making my clothes so when I cleaned out her house, when she had to go into the nursing home, she still had all kinds of crafts and zippers and buttons and, you know, all this stuff. So I made a board and it was, you know, about, about this big uh -huh. and it's, it sat on her wheelchair. You know, I would take it with me and I'd keep it in the closet there, but it had zippers. Mm -hmm. It would have buttonholes. I even found a plastic needle and made eyelets so she could thread those needles and on ribbons. 
I embroidered her name and my name and my brother's name and her husband's, you know, my dad's name. I embroidered names of the grandbabies and she would read them mm-hmm. in like in the middle. And I had Luella Boatman and that was her name. Mm-hmm. And she would say, that's me. Mm-hmm. Lou Allen, that's me. And, and I guess, and you know, it was kind of like, I, I hate to say it like this, but it was like when I finally accepted the fact that I was the parent and she was the child, mm-hmm. if I treated her like that, I got more from her. Mm-hmm. And I, did you find as well that, that it relieved a lot of her frustration? Oh, most definitely. Mm-hmm. It's when when I when I talked about the chapter I have on patience, it's more patience with yourself mm-hmm. first, and yeah. then you have more patience with them when they're trying to. You know, you go, okay, this is two plus two, and she think and think, and she go four. You know, she would she would eventually come up with it, and it, mm-hmm. you know, of course, a lot slower than you know what you think, but it was like, like she was back to when she was a kindergartner mm-hmm. or four year, mm-hmm. three years old, mm-hmm. you know, her brain could not, you know, measure it, but it kept her connected to me. Yeah. Everything, everything I've read about Alzheimer's is it's supposed to be a fast debilitating disease. Mm-hmm. My mom was, was diagnosed 10 years before she passed on. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think part of it was in, in, I'm not going to brag, but part of it was because of all the loving, tender care. Yeah, I think, I think, I think, you know, that um, because people you know, who, who suffer in some ways, that they, they see themselves being not useful, not wanted, they tend to go downhill much more quickly. But if you can give them the love, you can give them the care, you can relieve that frustration and, and all the other things around it, then they feel still valued. And then because they're valued, they can stay for much longer and have a better quality of life as well. Oh, definitely. We all have this sign on our back that says, make me feel important. Mm-hmm. Well, her little space, I made her feel important. She mm-hmm. was, even though, you know, she was once the center of my world, you know, I made her what, you know, she was still the center, mm-hmm. you know, when I was, nursing home and she you know was focused I you know I got to comb her hair like I said earlier I comb mm-hmm. her hair and I, I would dress her and, and make her feel pretty again mm-hmm. and, and you now that's important it's of very important. very important yeah very very important mm-hmm. um, especially if yeah. go ahead it's okay I just just got a phone call so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> just, just give me a was second is my wife she's on the way home so just give me a sec sorry about that my wife's a dj so she has the early morning show and she's finished and she's on her way home she wanted to know if i was going to the market or she was going to the market (laughs) (laughs) now y'all buy your meals almost daily don't you yeah we buy our veg virtually every day fresh it's it's not really um the thing here for people to to keep food for a long time or even buy frozen food there's very little in supermarkets Definitely, a, definitely no frozen veg. Yeah, or tins. You, have small, you have small refrigerators too. Right? Well, they're starting to get the big double door ones now. They seem to be the in thing, but there's no space for them. So people have them in the lounge next to the TV, and it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's funny. laughs> it is. You know, I, I saw a picture of one guy so proud. He's got it on the balcony. It takes the whole balcony up. He's so proud of the damn thing that is there that he now can afford it. <laughs> So. See, we, we in America just don't understand. Now I got to tour Israel mm-hmm. uh, back in 2011, and and you know that was an eye opener. Yeah, because we and you said you had been in Africa. Right? I've lived but, in Africa for 18 years. I've traveled through Africa from north to south, south to north, and then I lived in South Africa for 18 years, and then I came to China and I've been here 13 years. So I've lived on three continents. So I've seen a few things. <laughs> seen a few. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, I think travel is a great um, adventure. It's a good eye opener, and it can teach you a lot about yourself. You know, obviously, the pro- the problem is now I've got acclimatized to the tropics because I live in the subtropical part of China, not the north of China. And okay. if I go back to the UK, it's too cold. I see the girls or the guys outside the t-shirt, uh, sorry, outside the the pub having a cigarette in the t-shirt and their shorts. The skin's blue, and it's. I've got scarves and all sorts of things. I think there's something wrong with this picture, you know. Well, I, I 
think your blood thickens and thins depending on where you live. I think it does. I live, yeah. Yeah. I lived in Alaska when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And people couldn't understand how I could cope with it. Well, you know, it, we have a wet, wet cold. I don't, I guess we're not tropics here mm -hmm. in Texas. You know, I, I don't know if I said that, but I'm in Texas. Yeah, yeah. But, but when I went to Alaska, you know, your blood starts to thick. It's mm -hmm. totally different. Yeah, and and, and the, 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 yeah, the cold is different, isn't it? Because, you know, it can be minus 30, but because it's dry, it doesn't feel so bad. Whereas exactly. if it's damp and cold and miserable, then it really is not nice. It gets through into your bones. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, that, yeah. That's, that, that is a different. The thing I liked about South Africa, the weather-wise, in Johannesburg, was it was in the winter. Maybe it would go down to minus six or minus five at nighttime. But as soon as the sun came up, because of the altitude, it was gone in within half an hour, the cold. And it was 21, 22. And you'd have, like the, the, um, the screen behind me, a blue sky the whole day and no rain for three or four months. Everything was so dry, but there was a lot of static. But if you are, a, say, a mus musician and you have a guitar or a piano, you have a problem with keeping it in tune in the winter. <laughs> Yes, you do. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, and, that would. You know, I, I've walked down the shopping centre. There's been plants overhanging, and static sparks went <laughs> jumping off your ears. You know, <laughs> I, I even had my ex-wife. We went to kiss once, and <laughs> a big spark came between the lips because it's so dry. And you oh know, my at night time, you take your sweater off. It's just like you know, fireworks everywhere. There's so many sparks. And that's because of the dryness. You know, the downside is your fingernail, you know, your skin around your fingernails and that splits open. It's very easy to, to have that. It's, so the dry is, is interesting. But, you know, one of the advantages of that is washing. You put your washing out and it's dry within about two hours. You can just like <laughs> suck in all the water. <laughs> Yeah, and you said you live now in the tropical part of China. Yeah, the so you said subtropical part. Yeah, they call it. Yeah. Taiwan. My parents lived in Taipei, Taiwan. Yeah, I'm. I'm basically. If you go left from Taipei to the mainland, I'm there. You're right there. Yeah, okay, so it's, it's the same as sort of latitude, grow, altitude. You grow poinsettias there, or poinsettias grow wild there, right? Well, different parts. The, the most common plant here really is one of the the banyan tree. Um, but you know, in the streets of the city, we've got mango trees lining the road, you know, so you get up early in the morning in, in sort of late July, August, and you see guys walking, I'm sorry, I couldn't believe this, this guy's been out on the, the you know, the booze all night, he must be coming home, because he's walking down with one shoe on, and, and the other one's barefoot, and then next thing you know, there's a shoe fly in the air, and you look up, there's mangoes, they're trying to knock them out of the trees. <laughs> He's trying to get sober, huh? Well, no, he wasn't even drunk. He was just collecting mangoes. And then they sell them. They sit on the side of the road. They sell them. Oh, my gosh. To get another bottle for the next night. Well, no, I, I don't think he was drunk. It just I thought that was, you know, because it was 5 o'clock in the morning. That's what I my impression was because it looked so strange. No cars, no no people. He's just walking around with one shoe on, one shoe off. But he was out collecting. He was doing his, his, his farming, if you like. <laughs> oh, that is funny. Mm. So, you know, we see, we see so many different things just by going to different places. Right. Well, I'm a master gardener, so mm -hmm. whenever I travel, we went to Italy, when was it, three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, we've been back to Alaska many times, but, you know, Italy, just gorgeous. And I love, I just love plants. Yeah. So I was fascinated. Well, if you love plants, then South Africa, you know, especially the Cape area, has got some of the most beautiful plants in the world. They've got at least... 80% of the house plants were originally from that area. There's so many. So that, that that's really a nice place to go. And what I liked about the, um, especially the bush part from the animals and the, and the wild areas, is that the diversity of vegetation and the diversity of birds. There's so many different trees. I mean, there was one time it was on just about the border of Botswana, South Africa and um, Zimbabwe. There's a place there called the Tuli Block. And we were driving around, it was about um, uh, the end of December, beginning, no, about the middle of January. And we're driving around at dusk and we could smell potatoes, Ro you know, roasting potatoes. Like, what the heck, you know, we're in the middle of the bush, who's doing roast potatoes? It's a particular plant that gives off the scent in the evening. It's, it's, it's just weird. Yeah, 
It's really weird. I never found the plant because, you know, we were in big five countries, so it's not easy to get out and walk around, especially at dusk, you know. It's not the best time because that's when the predators start getting a bit more active. But we never found the plant, but they were there everywhere. The whole area was just sort of permeated with this smell. It's wonderful. So ah, these are the little things. That. Yeah, I'll these are the little things that you don't normally experience, and, and they make the whole, you know, the whole thing. So there's huh. a lot of stuff there. So yeah, it's good. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So time's getting on a little bit. I don't want to keep you for too long. Um, <clears throat> so you've spoken a lot about your 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 mother and how you were very creative in getting her to be more engaged with you know with with life and communication and things like that. So what would what would be your biggest um, tip for somebody who is in a similar situation? How would you know you suggest they they go about working um, as communication strategy? Should we say? Well, it, it it would depend on who, you know what their parents' loves were. Mm -hmm. if, they're, if they're say their loves were plants, yeah, you know, have, have a, if the nursing home will allow, and most of them will, mm -hmm. have a garden area and and help your your mother or your father, because a lot of men love to garden as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. But but it, you know whatever their love is, mm -hmm. try to, or whatever their passion was when they when they were at their normal, mm -hmm. try to bring that back in. And and yes, you're going to have to bring it back in at minimal. Um, one of the things you know, uh, crossword puzzles mm -hmm. are really good, or even even coloring, uh -huh. you know, or it, you mentioned. Uh, musical instruments mm -hmm. in a very interesting thing if they played the piano mm -hmm. they still can play the piano yeah because it's in the longer term memory isn't it in the longer term memory or if they you know if they had an instrument they played a guitar or whatever or if they you know just cater just find remember back Mm -hmm. what their passions were in in you know zero in on those passions and make that the one thing that I want to say is you have to kind of get out of, um, and I, I don't want to say everyone's like this, but you have to get out of your head and get into their head mm -hmm. and, and and think like, what what would make mom happy or what would make dad happy? You know, my, my dad wanted to go to have a steak. Mm -hmm. I made arrangements so that we could go, you know, take him to, it, it was a sad experience because he couldn't even cut the steak, he couldn't cut you know. Them, yeah. But yeah, at I least he it. went there. Though. Yes, yes. So I mean, you know, I tried to find things that mm -hmm. that you know um, that that were their passions before, because you can't create something new no. once they get it. No, but you have to find out, yeah. right? And I think I think keeping them active as well is important because I've seen some nursing homes where all they do is they put them in the chair, and then they switch on the TV. And they leave them there in front of the TV. They, they, you know, the staff go about their business. They come and they give them food or drinks and whatever. Take them to the toilet when they need to go, or the doctor visit. But there's nothing for them to do, so they're basically vegetating even more. Right. Whereas you get the, the other nursing homes who've got these art classes, or they've got these um, music classes, sing-alongs, or they've got activities organised by people. And then yeah, they play bingo. Yeah, you know. yeah, and then then they've got a purpose, haven't they? They, they definitely do. The mm. nursing home I go to every Friday, uh, they have we have to be out of there before their bingo because everybody's excited. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't and you steal my bingo time. <laughs> they, they go, and we win quarters, and, you know, evidently mm -hmm. they can go spend their quarters because they have a bus that takes them to Walmart, you know. Mm -hmm. and, so it, you know, it's it's kind of funny because we have to schedule things around their bingo. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's about trying to give them as, as normal a life as possible, isn't it? Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Try to keep it as normal and not let them know your frustrations. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, you know, because I can guarantee you my heart and my, you know, would be pounding mm -hmm. every time because, you know, she wasn't there, but I had to play like she was. Yeah. So I'm kind of like an imaginary name, she, game. She was still my mom. Mm -hmm. Mom, what do you think about this? You know, and you know, and I try to, you know, engage her. And if that didn't work, we, you know, one time, oh, I have to share this with you. One time, my husband and I went into the 
in, in to see my mom and we usually would go to her room and, and I would be working with her and, and all of a sudden she looked at my husband. Now you have to understand he is kind of built like my dad was. Mm -hmm. So my mom thought he was her husband. Okay, yeah. And she wanted to talk about what they did last night. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I knew where this was going and I did not <laughs> want it to go there. So I pulled out a parenting trick and I said, Mom, I got her. She kisses in my pocket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I had to distract her because she was going down the road. Because at one point she says, you just shut up. I'm talking to your daddy. <laughs> yeah. I go, okay. Well, you don't want any Hershey kisses? I brought you Hershey kisses. Mm -hmm. And it took a few minutes to distract her. But I got her off on that one. You got so I never heard that story. And I don't want to hear this <laughs> No, you story. don't need to, no. <laughs> do, you, do you think that, the you know, um, the sense of being a burden on the family is, is a big thing. And it is, it's just something that has to be found a way to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I did. you know, is it is it more prevalent if they live at home with you, or if they go to the nursing home? Would you say? I think it has to do with their level of rehabilitation, mm -hmm. and you know, I guess I think I said earlier, I've had friends who brought their mothers home with them, mm -hmm. and it ended up being a really love hate relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, they. They were, they were, it, if you think about our parents, mm -hmm. they never want to be a burden to us. Yeah. I never want to be a burden to my, you know, my kids. Mm -hmm. They want us to have as normal a life as we can. Mm -hmm. And I have, you know, but I have friends that ended up, you know, they resented their mother mm -hmm. for put them in that position. Mm -hmm. I never, because of my situation and because having my father-in-law live with us for seven years and I had gone through it mm -hmm. and I knew moms, I loved, I loved her dearly. And my husband would have brought her in, in a New York minute. We were going to convert the living room, mm -hmm. but I, I knew my mom well enough that in a way I gave her the best care she could have because I was still working. Mm -hmm. and she was in a nursing home and she was a very social person. Mm -hmm. So she had someone to talk to all day long mm -hmm. and the nurses and the other residents and they all would chit and chat and tell each other the same stories over and over and over, but it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. But I put her back in a social environment where prior to her going, going, if she had come to my house, I mean, I could have gotten someone to come in, but it wouldn't have been the same thing because yeah. she had, she had lots of people around her mm -hmm. and I could have had someone come in and it would have just been this one person. That's not my mother. My mother was in all kinds of clubs and used to a lot of people around her. Mm -hmm. So I, I know in my heart, I did the best thing for her, but mm -hmm. I do have a friend that built a house out behind her house for mm -hmm. her mother. And, uh, although they feel very tied down, um, you know, she doesn't resent. So it, it, it's an ind individual thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, what it I'm is. saying, it's got to be in your heart and soul and you mm -hmm. have to, but you have to look at the long term and mm -hmm. go, you know, am I ready to, um, am I ready to put her in a nursing home if I have to, you know, at mm -hmm. some point or keep her with me right here until she dies. I know families that have five and six kids mm -hmm. and they take turns. And that yeah, works. yeah. I think, as you say, you, you've got to look at the situation from from so many different angles and, and consider which is the best for her or for the you know for the person who's uh, in that situation. Some people would work better in a in a, a home situation because they've got more life with all the other um, new friends they've got. Other people would be working much better in a family situation. And you know, on the other side of the coin, there's um, a colleague of mine who's a, who's a hypnotherapist. And he had a client come to him and this woman was about 65 or 70 and she was furious with her mother because her mother had died just recently and she spent her whole life looking after her mother and she hadn't got married, she hadn't got grandchildren, she hadn't got anything and now her sole purpose in life has disappeared and she didn't know how to cope with that change. Right. So, well, you know, it's important to keep that life balance anyway, isn't it? No matter what happens, no matter what the circumstances are. Yeah, the bottom line is 
I know for my, my, you know, my kids, I don't want them to take care of me. In fact, my goal is to make enough. I can build my own nursing home and I can live in it. Yeah. Or you can go to Alaska and, 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 and hug the grizzly bears. <laughs> well, well, I told someone the other day, I said, the funny thing is I want to build my own nursing home, have my own little unit over here. And then wandering around and and some of the other residents go that lady acts like she owns this place and the nurses say she does <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but you know i i having gone through it mm -hmm. i'm doing totally different with my you know i'm preparing things in fact i've got things in my house mm -hmm. that i've got labels under them and i know which grandkids going to get that and i've got a list of who gets what i'm I, of course I was kind of like an only child with my brother in Alaska. Mm -hmm. I ended up with all of it, you know, here, here with us, mm -hmm. but you know, yeah, each, everybody's got to cope with it themselves. However, they think they can mm -hmm. deal with it, but they need to do a lot of soul searching. Yeah. And they also need to think external help. So, you know, where, where would you suggest they go to for that type of help for, you know, because it is a, a major, major uh, trauma really in, in, in their life when they have that, situation there, thrust upon them there are groups i've been in alzheimer groups i've been in dementia groups mm -hmm. they're all kind of support groups and i know some people are pretty much loners and they think they can do it themselves but these groups are fabulous for sharing and what it is is everyone's going through the same thing mm -hmm. maybe at a different level but they're going through it together and there's just something about people supporting other people. And, and that's basically what I'm trying to say in my book. You're not out there alone. Yeah. We're, we're, you know, we're all going to either, we've either been a caregiver or we're going to be a caregiver. Mm -hmm. Just the way medicine's going, you know, I mean, my grand, great grandparents, you know, didn't live as long as we're going to, I keep telling my kids I'm going to live be 112. Yeah. But, <laughs> well, you, you, know, you know, I think you need a safe place to go to to vent your own frustration and, and to discuss your own fears rather than take it out on the person who it's not their fault, you know, and, and it is, you know, easy if you're not careful to, to vent your frustration on them. And that's not, yes. you know, that's not a good thing. It's not a healthy thing. No, there's Alzheimer's uh, groups everywhere. There's just, just, just venting groups, mm -hmm. you know, and we all, uh, even if we're married, sometimes there's things we don't want to tell our spouse. Oh, yeah. So, I, mean, I, I remember there was, I, I can't remember when I was reading this now, but there was some, I think it was in uh, Eastern Europe, so there were a couple of houses where you could go and you could rent the house for a, an hour or two. And, it, you know, it was furnished <laughs> and you could smash the heck out of the house and come out feeling much better. <laughs> Oh, that's a great idea. You know, it, it was a sort of a copy of the, the Japanese thing where they have the, the model of the boss and some of the workers could go in and beat the boss up. So, but it relieves that tension and it relieves yes. that frustration in a safe way. And then you can come out, you, you know, and then you can deal with the, the challenges in a much more mature way, can't you? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Mm. Once you you know, vented or even if you have to get therapy, there is nothing wrong. I think, I mean, this is only my, my opinion, mm -hmm. but I think everyone at one time or another in their life need therapy. Mm -hmm. They need, they need, you know, a professional to listen to, you know, what they're going through. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, of course I like group. I like the groups better. There's Alzheimer's, you know, therapy groups and all, but I'll be honest with you. I've even, even gone to therapy and, and told my story and, and someone could have me look at it through a different lens. No, I mean, I it's, would... it's about that support element, isn't it? That, that you know, that yeah. we have to have, you know, in lives. I mean, from a very young child, we have the support. And, you know, as adults, we sometimes think we're beyond that, but it's not true. Because there's no. always something you have a question about, you, you know, and two minds are better than one and et cetera, et cetera, you know, the whole story. So I think it is a crucial thing. And it's not that there's something wrong with you. It's just that you're looking for people who've got more experience to give you advice and give you that um, place, as we said, to vent or to, to you know, um, express your feelings where it wouldn't be appropriate elsewhere. And you can, and they can give you options. Yeah. And choose to take them or not. Yeah. That's the, That's the beauty, isn't it? it? Yeah. And, and the beauty of those mm -hmm. groups is you don't know your story might help someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what you've gone through and go, oh my gosh, I hadn't thought of that. So, yeah. you know, the mutual, you know, helping and 
that's well, what just, society just, just 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 exchanging the stories i mean you can learn so yeah. much from that can't you just like we've, yeah. we've exchanged a couple of stories if someone out there is going to be able to say that's the answer or it gives, stimulates them in a different way of thinking or something like that and, and then they make the changes or they they make the successes that they've been looking for yeah and, and, and we, we talked about it laughter mm -hmm. oh yeah laughter is well we've is been laughing <laughs> yes we have been laughing a lot but laughter is so healing and it such is. a good therapy it is. It is. and i would i would do like you know that joke i was telling you the frayed knot mm -hmm. i would get mom into that frayed knot joke as much as i could mm -hmm. because that was just something that was kind of seated in her brain and she'd yeah. remember you know it, it's like the smile you know people say the smile, the smile is infectious and if a smile is infectious how much more infectious is laughter you know, laughter it's, yeah. you know, and it changes uh, emotions it changes the mood with the people it releases energy which would have otherwise been trapped it does so many many things so it, you know it, it is in, in a lot of ways one of the best therapies in the world yes i, I totally agree with you mm -hmm. so you know yeah. find ways to get, get the laughter but it's very difficult to make laughter center point in your life if your frustration and everything else is overpowering it so that's why you need the support groups to, to free that and, and allow you to laugh. And, you know, if you can laugh at yourself, that's also a wonderful, wonderful benefit. Definitely. You know, Definitely. so it's yeah. something we need to work on. And, and sometimes we need to get help to learn to laugh. You know, it's, yeah. you know. Yeah. And yeah, if you can't laugh at yourself, there is there's something blocked there. Yeah. So you find that. Okay, what, what, you know, there's something in their life, and it could have been something traumatic that happened as a child. Yeah. You never know. And, you know, you, you, you don't always have to know what it is as long as you can release that block. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, they don't have to tell you their, their secrets, mm -hmm. the deep dark secrets, to, to release that. So, on, on the notes of um, uh, help, support, et cetera, et cetera, your book obviously is going to be a wonderful, wonderful resource. So wow. how do we get hold of it? Well, I'm going to show you the book. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's the book. Can you see that? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Just keep it still for a second. Okay. You have yep. to laugh to keep crying mm -hmm. out of parent parents. And if you see the hands there. Yeah, yeah I can see the hands. I don't see your that name. Is not, oh, <laughs> that is not a stock. Uh, my name's at the okay, very bottom. Okay, yeah, I can see that now, yeah. That is not a stock picture. That's that a is real my picture. Mother. That is my mother's hands, and okay. I'm holding her. Okay. It, I never dreamed that was going to end up being the cover of a book. Mm -hmm. That was. But that's that's a very poignant book a cover. That. Thank you. I, I'm I'm real proud of the mm -hmm. book. But thinking, uh, I'll show you the. Can you can you see that? Just go up a little bit. I, I'm going to type this in the chat box as well, so that people can see it. Okay. So parentyourparentsbook.com. www.parentyourparents.com. Okay. Yeah. And then there's my email. Info at csanyanpublishing.com. Right. Right. Well, I've got that. So what I'll do is I, I'll, I'll put that on the website and I'll also type it in the chat box so people can can easily right. see and, it. And they're still building. <clears throat> my, my book is so new. They're still building my websites mm -hmm. and my Twitter is, site. And is my, the book published at the moment or is it coming out very soon? Coming out December 15th. December the 15th. If we're on the market for December 15th okay. because my goal. My goal was to put one in the stocking of every one of my fam well, family. That's a nice. That's a nice gesture. So they can they could read those stories. Mm -hmm. So December December the fifteenth, and yeah. it'll be available on Amazon and all the other places. Yes, it'll be. You can free, you'll be able to free download it okay. on Amazon. Okay. You know, so yes, yes. Okay. I just wanted to read a quick story. I was going to tell you my daughter-in-law is only one of three people that have read my book. Mm -hmm. She was the year in texas and she was crying and she said charlotte i couldn't put it down you made me laugh you made me cry you brought back so many memories of my mama and she had lost her mama a long time ago mm -hmm. so that was a blessing and just yeah, yeah that, that was a that's, blessing it's a wonderful thing to hear you know and i think that uh, i think more people are going to be affected in the same way well, I hope so, because that's yeah. that's. And that's obviously, I think they're going to get a great deal of benefit um, from the knowledge and the understanding, the stories in there, and I think it will help so many people. So, you know, I, I'm really grateful that you took the time to share these personal stories with people in the book and obviously here. 
Well, thank you, Stuart. I appreciate it. You know, and you know, I, it's getting on a little bit. I don't want to keep you too late. Um, so, do you have any last words of advice for people? You know, the advice that I would give is you need to love and respect your parents while they're here. Mm -hmm. Because once they're gone, you don't want to live with the regrets. No. That's a very true, very wise piece of advice. Very, very wise. So on that note and, and, and the other note that learn to laugh, even at your misfortune, <laughs> then I, I think that uh, you've given us some wonderful, wonderful tips. And I'm so grateful that you know we, we, we met because you've enriched my life. And uh, hopefully you can enrich many, many other people's lives as well. God will and it'll happen. Okay, so thank you once again and thank you to all the listeners. And, uh, you know, I'm sure they've had a wonderful experience and uh, I just hope they go out and get your book and then learn from it. Even if they don't have, you know, this situation now or in the future, they can still learn so much from the book. I think there's going to be so much advice in there that's just poignant to real life, you know. Well, everybody cares for somebody at some point. Yeah. It could be a spouse, an aunt, you yeah, know, grandma. Anybody, it doesn't matter, yeah. Even themselves, just learning how to laugh at themselves. So there we are. <laughs> yes, there you are. <laughs> okay, then, Charlotte. Thanks once again, and thank you again to the listeners. It's been wonderful. It was a pleasure. Confidence Bites, your weekly confidence building show, was brought to you by Stuart Elliott from Double C Coaching. www.doubleccoaching.com. D O U B L E C C C O A C H ing.com For regular confidence building tips, subscribe to this channel today and don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Stuart Double C Capital S T U A R T Capital D O U B L E Capital C at Stuart Double C